All right, let's head back to the hemolytic anemias. Like I mentioned earlier, intrinsic means that something was intrinsically wrong with the RBC that caused it to be lysed. Hereditary spherocytosis is a defect in either anchorin, band 3, protein 4.2, or spectrin. These are all structural proteins that stabilize the RBC membrane. Affected RBCs have less membrane and structure, causing a loss of the biconcave disc shape and therefore a loss of the central pallor. These cells become smaller and rounder, hence the name spherocyte. So why are spherocytes destroyed? Well, imagine a normal biconcave RBC, like a Ziploc bag that's partly full of water but still pretty flexible. It can still squeeze through the small spaces like sinusoids of the spleen. But if you were to fill that bag up with water until it's plump and stiff, well then you've got a spherocyte. Even if the bag were overall smaller, it can't squeeze through those small spaces in the spleen, so they get stuck. And the macrophages in the spleen come around and, well, they phagocytize that RBC. This leads to a splenomegaly as well as an anemia. In actuality, these patients would be just fine if their spleen wasn't eating up their RBCs so quickly. Therefore, the definitive cure for these patients is actually a splenectomy, after which the patient's blood counts should improve. Do you remember what you expect to see on a peripheral smear after the patient has no spleen? Yep, these patients would develop the Howell Jolly bodies that we talked about in an asplenic state. To diagnose these patients, the classic test is a positive osmotic fragility test. This test would show that RBCs are more likely to lyse in hypoosmolar solutions since they had deficient structural proteins. They literally swell up and pop more easily than normal RBCs. You would also suspect a patient with spherocytosis to have an elevated mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. And in fact, spherocytosis is one of the few conditions that will increase this value. So for hereditary spherocytosis, remember, positive osmotic fragility tests and increased MCHC. Spherocytosis is a form of extravascular hemolysis, since hemolysis occurs primarily due to the reticuloendothelial system, mostly located in the spleen, taking out the defective cells. G6PD deficiency was discussed in biochemistry, but it doesn't hurt to review it again because it comes up a lot on your boards. This is partly because it's the most common enzyme deficiency in humans. In short, this X-linked defect is in the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. This eventually reduces the stores of glutathione, rendering RBCs more susceptible to oxidative stress and ultimately leading to hemolysis and anemia. The patient may present with back pain and hemoglobinurea, aka hemoglobin or its products in the urine, a few days after the stressor. A blood smear will show the Heinz bodies and the bite cells that we discussed earlier. This process of hemolysis is both intra- and extravascular because these cells encounter stress in both the bloodstream, like the small capillaries, and in the spleen. Oxidative stressors that incite this event may come in many different forms, including sulfa drugs, infections, fava beans, some antimalarials, and dapzone. Next up is pyruvate kinase deficiency, and do you remember from biochemistry what step this enzyme was responsible for? That would be the conversion of PEP to pyruvate. Basically, a deficiency in this enzyme leads to a deficiency in ATP, which is required for your sodium potassium pumps to function, and without which, cells hold on to too much solute, their volume expands, and their membranes become too rigid. This will lead to hemolysis, and specifically an extravascular hemolysis, because the reticuloendothelial system will take up these rigid RBCs and dispose of them as they appear abnormal. This is an extravascular hemolysis because the actual intrinsic deficiency of pyruvate kinase does not lead to the hemolysis itself. Rather, it leads to a stiff wall, which then leads to the extravascular hemolysis. Since this is a genetic defect, patients typically present with hemolysis as newborns. The hemoglobin C defect is caused by a beta chain mutation. It's actually at the same site as sickle cell disease, but in hemoglobin C, there is a glutamic acid to lysine mutation at residue 6. And in sickle cell, there is a glutamic acid to valine mutation. We'll discuss sickle cell in a few minutes, but hemoglobin C patients do have a milder presentation than those with homozygous sickle cell disease.
This is mostly because hemoglobin C does not polymerize in the way that hemoglobin S does. Patients can be heterozygous for both hemoglobin C and sickle cell mutations, and this will lead to a milder disease in either homozygous states. You may receive far more questions about the sickle cell defect than the hemoglobin C defect. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinurea is another cause of intrinsic and intravascular hemolytic anemia. In healthy patients, the CD55, otherwise known as the decay accelerating factor, or DAF, helps to prevent potentially dangerous effects of complement from acting on native cells. Do you remember from immunology why this attack would happen? While complement is a component of the innate immune system, it can't really distinguish native from foreign on its own, so it's up to your cells to turn off the complement cascade if they begin to act on native cells. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinurea occurs when DAF, its anchor protein called GPI, or other associated proteins with DAF, are not synthesized. These proteins normally protect the RBCs from this complement-mediated lysis. Lab tests will show an increased urine hemosiderin. Remember this is also a type of intravascular hemolysis because of the complement system. When these cells do lyse, they will do so in the bloodstream. These patients can be identified with the triad of Coombs negative hemolytic anemia, pancytopenia, and venous thrombosis. Also, your labs will show a negative CD55 and CD59 that will not be seen on RBCs under flow cytometry. What would be a good treatment method for this disease? Well, how about a monoclonal antibody to complement? That would be awesome. And indeed, the treatment is echolizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody to complement. Sickle cell anemia is an autosomal recessive disease because you need two mutations to have full sickle cell anemia. One mutation is known as sickle cell trait. Sickle cell disease is most common in African Americans, with up to 8% of the population carrying the hemoglobin S trait. We mentioned the hemoglobin S mutation before, but do you remember what that mutation is? It is the sixth amino acid in the beta globin chain and features a change from glutamic acid to valine. Because valine is a hydrophobic amino acid, the exposed valine on one side of a hemoglobin will want to get out of its natural watery environment so it will stick to a valine on a neighboring hemoglobin. Then the valine on that hemoglobin will stick to the next and so on and so on until you have polymerized or form a chain with all of this hemoglobin and you'll see a very long chain of polymerized hemoglobin that begins to push out on the cell wall deforming the cell from its round biconcave shape into a crescent or sickled shape. Newborns are initially unaffected due to the predominance of hemoglobin F but when the gamma chain of hemoglobin F begins to be replaced by the beta chain of hemoglobin A usually around six months of age the phenotypic expression begins. Dactylitis, or painful hand swelling, is often a presenting sign in childhood, and this fact is commonly tested on your exam. Hypoxia, dehydration, or acidosis tend to trigger polymerization of hemoglobin S molecules, thus sickling the RBCs. This leads to issues that can affect all areas of the body. The basic problem is that patients are anemic due to lysis of these deformed cells and that sickle cells cause vasoocclusion that can be extremely dangerous and painful. Vasoocclusion precipitates many of the disease sequela in sickle cell anemia. The occlusion of veins can also occlude much of the rich blood conduits flowing through the spleen, leading to diffuse infarctions and ultimately an autosplenectomy. As with all splenectomy patients, this can lead to an increased risk of infections by encapsulated organisms. Do you remember what these encapsulated organisms were from your microbiology lectures? That would be Streptococcus, Haemophilus influenza, and Neisseria. Parvovirus B19 can precipitate an aplastic crisis in sickle cell patients. This can be life-threatening. Also, sickle cell patients are more prone to Salmonella osteomyelitis. Do you remember the most common cause of osteomyelitis in non-sickle cell patients? That is Staphylococcus.
Patients can also get renal papillary necrosis from papillary hypoxemia after sickle cells occlude a blood supply in the kidney in an area that is normally limited in its blood supply. Microinfarctions can also lead to microhematuria. The most common cause of death in sickle cell patients is due to acute chest syndrome. And be sure to remember that the test loves most commons. Acute chest syndrome is often brought on by infection, and the resulting inflammation can precipitate the dreaded vasoocclusion. Acute chest syndrome is characterized by fever, cough, extreme pain, dyspnea, and eventually hypoxia and death. Treatment for crisis in sickle cell disease is typically rehydration, treatment of any infectious causes, pain control, supportive care, and exchange transfusions. Hydroxyurea is given prophylactically in many cases of sickle cell anemia because its actions increase the hemoglobin F concentration, thereby reducing polymerization of hemoglobin S and further vasoocclusive crises. Why is it that some African populations have a far higher proportion of this mutated allele than other populations? Well, it turns out that heterozygotes of the sickle cell mutation are resistant to malarial infection and have very few heme-related problems. So even though the homozygotes have a debilitating disease, heterozygotes carry a survival advantage in endemic areas of malaria. This is thought to explain, at least in part, why this gene mutation remains as prevalent as it does in its native populations. Can you think of another example of this phenomenon of carrier fitness, where the heterozygote has some survival advantage that leads to the persistence of a diseased gene in a population. Well, one other example is the gene for cystic fibrosis, which is thought to confer some protection against cholera. Other than the sickling of hemoglobin, what other abnormalities can be found on the peripheral smear of an adult sickle cell anemia patient? One may also find these Howell Jolly bodies in the peripheral smear of a patient with sickle cell anemia. As we said earlier, patients with sickle cell anemia will eventually suffer from an autosplenectomy, and thus will no longer be able to remove these Howell Jolly bodies from their peripheral RBCs. Now that we've covered the intrinsic anemias, let's talk about the extrinsic anemias. There are four main extrinsic hemolytic anemias, autoimmune, microangiopathic, macroangiopathic, and infectious. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia can be further classified as being caused by warm agglutinins or by cold agglutinins. Warm agglutinin disease involves IgG antibodies against RBCs. These can be noted with lupus, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or drugs like methyl dopa. Cold agglutinin involves IgM antibodies against RBCs and these are seen in the setting of mycoplasma pneumoniae or infectious mononucleosis. Attacks by cold agglutins are triggered by cold temperatures and especially in exposed regions of the body such as the fingertips, toes, earlobes, and the tip of the nose. Hence the name cold agglutinin. There is a commonly used mnemonic to help you remember this. Warm weather is great and cold weather is miserable. Unfortunately, in many cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, no actual cause is identified, and the patients are said to have idiopathic warm or idiopathic cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. To diagnose autoimmune disease, you can use either a direct or indirect Coombs test. A direct Coombs test would look to see if there were any antibodies bound to RBCs by adding an anti-immunoglobulin antibody, or a Coombs reagent, to the serum and testing for agglutination. An indirect Coombs test attempts to identify if there are circulating anti-RBC antibodies by adding someone else's RBCs to the patient's distilled serum. If there are anti-RBC antibodies, then they will attach to the new RBCs, and when the Coombs reagent is added, it will bind to all of the RBC-bound antibodies, and you will see agglutination. Microangiopathic anemias are caused by obstructed or narrowed vessel lumina that shear RBCs. What type of abnormal RBC will be identified by microscopy in this disease? That would be the schistocyte 
and as you can see here, these cells look like they've been knocked around a bit, and several are fragmented. There are several ideologies for microangiopathic anemias, and these include disseminated intravascular coagulation, otherwise known as DIC, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP, hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, lupus, and malignant hypertension. Macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia essentially shares the same idea as the microversion, but with large, typically foreign objects breaking up the RBCs. A prime example would be the prosthetic heart valve. Finally, some infections like malaria and babesia can lead to increased destruction of RBCs.